Praise, praise, praise the Lord. We've had a very exciting month, a great month indeed. Great things happened and are still happening. We had testimonies, soulish testimonies, bodily testimonies, circumstantial testimonies. And it's just been an extraordinary month and we know it's from glory to glory in Jesus' precious name. A brother met me yesterday and said, um, he walked into the meeting casually in the course of the prayers. Prayers were made for him. And um, I think he said the hand of God, a declaration was made that the hand of God would be strong on his life. He went back home went on a three days dry fast, started reading the Bible, could not stop, finished three days dry fast, broke it, went on another three days dry, and he's just been on fire, studying and tonguing. We had to bring counsel to help him manage other aspects of life so that he doesn't just remain, become, <laughs> you know, so great testimonies in that regard. And then testimonies of healings, testimonies of financial turnaround. Maybe on Sunday we'll just take a few of them. I don't uh, take testimonies all the time because people can easily start coming to God for what he gives. But when you know him, when you apprehend him, he said all these things shall be added unto you. A brother met me, he said um, he was going through financial crisis and he was actually looking for somebody to lend him some money to, to, to get a car for the Uber business and all of that. And nobody was forthcoming. And so when he strode in the course of the prayers, spoke with him, and I was led to give him 20,000 naira. I gave him 20,000 naira. Two weeks later, somebody gave him 10 million. <laughs> you thought you were here. 50,000. Somebody just gave him 10 million and it's been two weeks before, 20,000 was a huge te testimony. When he met me yesterday, he was wearing a Prada shirt. <laughs> he has entered designers. <laughs> so God, can you imagine? He's now buying a shirt for the money that was a testimony. And he said there are many things, but Maybe when we have time. Ah, when we have time. <laughs> the Lord is good. And so it's important for us to learn the word, receive the word, apply the word until the word begins to speak in our lives. Because that's God's plan for us. And so tonight, I just want to teach us some very simple principles that makes for manifestations in the kingdom. I call it protocols of manifestation and so tonight I believe that somebody will learn something that he would apply you know the beautiful thing about life is not the interventions that we receive when you still live at the level of receiving interventions things can still happen to you things can still go wrong what God expects us to or how God expects us to live is to come to a realm of dominion where we don't we don't necessarily receive interventions where we make things happen that's where god wants us to operate from when he created the man he gave him dominion dominion is authority over circumstances authority to make things happen so things no longer really happen to you as it were you make things happen and for you to operate at that level there are protocols you know manifestations of the things of God should not be a wonder to us. We were created to manifest God and to manifest his possibilities. The people of the world actually should be the ones who call these things miracles. When you read the Bible, Jesus didn't call these things miracles because that was his natural. The disciples didn't call these extraordinary happenings miracles. 
We give nomenclature to these things so that the people of the world can understand. But we are supposed to live there. We are supposed to live in that excelling realm of reality. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it said, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people called forth to manifest, to showcase, and to reveal the excellencies of God. So it is our calling as a people to naturally give expression to supernatural things. That means our real life, our original expression is a miraculous life. Isaiah said, I and the children that the Lord has given to me, he said, we are for signs and we are for wonders. So manifestation of extraordinary realities or the God realities are supposed to be natural to us. If they are not natural, it means there is a gap in understanding. And so teachings like this come to bridge that gap that we have in spiritual understanding so that we come into the realm of manifestation. You see, when you study the scriptures, you discover some of the men that truly made impact. They didn't make impact by accident. They knew that it was their birthright in Christ. It was their birthright in God to manifest God. But they also knew they were, they were protocols. They knew that manifestations are at the mercy of divine protocols. If you know these protocols, it becomes natural to you. I was telling them at the prayer meeting yesterday, I told them, when you see a man who is powerful, he's powerful because he knows what to do. And I, if you were sensitive on Sunday, I was teaching you three ways of using words to change things. And I called it prophecy. I said, number one, you use words to change things when you are sent and when you are at the center of the will of God. What you say is as good as a prophecy. And so if God sends me to you and I discern God's will for you in that circumstance, I cannot make a decree like God speaking. Because I am sent and because I now discern God's will, anything I say must happen. That was what Elijah demonstrated when he came to the widow of Zarephath. God never said, tell the widow food will not finish. Elijah did not even know there was a crisis of food. Because God told him, I've commanded the widow to sustain you. So naturally Elijah was coming, hoping that there was abundance of food. But when Elijah came, to his greatest surprise, the woman said, I have left just a cup of dough to prepare for myself and my son to eat and die. But Elijah knew God sent him to this widow. And so immediately Elijah said, Thus said the Lord. He said, That dough will not finish. God didn't say that. But when the man showed up, he knew he was sent to the widow. And he also knew the will of God was for the widow to preserve him. Because this too was in alignment, by spiritual intelligence, he began to proclaim what God would have said if he was there. And according to the word of Elijah, the food never finished. And so the first way to use words to change things is to be sent and to discern God's will on the matter. If I look at you and I know that God wants you to get married now and I'm sent to you, I can pocket my hand and tell you if this year passes and you don't marry, I'm not sent. Because I now know the will of God and I know I'm sent to you. I, I can be a star. If I know that God is saying you will be married this season and I'm sent to you, I can look at you and say, when do you want to get married? I know the window is open. If you say this year, I say, it is done. I'll be there. That's how you use words to change things, to discern God's will. And I said the second way to use words to change things is to speak as you are commanded. That's what happened in Ezekiel 37. The guy came to a valley of dry bones. And God said, can these bones live? He didn't know the will of God, so he was quiet. If he knew the will of God, he would have been authorized. But he didn't know the will of God. He said, only thou knowest. And God said, speak to the bones. Ah, the guy became a commander. And everything he heard and said happened. Bones joined to bones. Flesh came upon the bones. 
the wind came and filled the bones up, an exceeding great army arose. Why? Because he heard. And so the second way you change things by words is when you hear. And then I said the third way you change things by word is through the Rema word. Under certain atmosphere, the word of God is quickened. And so when you are under that atmosphere and you, the word of God moves in your spirit, if you say it, it must happen. Because at that time, the word of God becomes a creative force. And so when you see a man declaring and things are happening, you can say this man is a powerful man. Not necessarily so. The man doesn't necessarily need to be powerful. He has understanding. And so when the man comes into a situation, while everybody is excited, he is finding the will of God. The moment he knows the will of God, he begins to declare. You are seeing things happening, but he knows why things are happening. Things are happening because he has been able to isolate God's will. The man can stand and everybody is confused. He's straining his ear to be able to hear what God is saying. If he can hear God, he begins to make declarations and things begin to happen. And you look at him, you say he's a powerful man. He's not necessarily a powerful man. Three things happen. Either because he discerned God's will and he spoke, taking advantage of God's will, or because he heard what God was saying at that time and he declared what God said, or the Rema word came alive in his spirit and he proclaimed it. Because of this, he's a commander over circumstances. And so if you want to change things in your life, when the devil is raging, you avoid that distraction. Because you know if you get involved, you are in trouble. There are many crises that come to spiritual men. And this crisis wants to create anxiety. Because that's the strategy of the devil. The devil knows how you change things. You are not the only person who is educated in spiritual things. The devil is also educated. And that's why when there is a situation, the devil wants to create a chaos in your spirit. Because he knows that if there is a chaos in your spirit, you will not be able to discern God's will. You will not be able to hear God. And the Rema word can come. And the devil knows if these three things don't happen, if you like shout, you can't change things. If you like scream, you can't change things. So when there is a confusion, the first thing the devil wants to do is to create a disbalance in your spirit, to create a chaos, because he knows how things change. But when you see a man who has understanding, when there is crisis, he holds his peace. That's why they ran to Jesus. They say, trouble not the master. The young girl is dead. They say, fear not. Keep your calm, quickly. Because whether this girl will come back to life or not, it's not because I'm Jesus. This girl will come back to life if we isolate the voice of God or if we discern God's will or if the Rema word comes. But if you allow panic, these three things can happen. And even me, Jesus, will not raise her to life. So spiritual people are powerful because they have understanding. The moment understanding comes to you, you become a victor in life. And so manifestations are our birthright as believers in Christ. But manifestations are not without a protocol. It takes protocols for manifestations to happen. And so if you want to see a manifestation in your life, learn the protocols, align to the protocols, and you will see that what that powerful, powerful prophet does, what that powerful apostle does, you can also do it from your bedroom. Because what makes them powerful, apart from the calling, is the understanding that they have. And the understanding is available to everyone that wishes to receive it. Praise God. Let me read the scripture for you. In Leviticus chapter 9 verse 6, hear what Moses said. I told you about the 12 articles of the glory. The glory is the fullness of God. Here was a man walking in the wilderness, speaking with so much authority. Moses knew what to do for the glory of God to appear. It's not trial and error. He knows any day, any time. And hear what he said. He said, and Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded that ye should do and that the glory of the Lord will appear unto you. That means there are men who can command the appearing of the glory of God any day, any time because they know the protocol. If you also know the protocol, you will do it and the glory will appear. That means the difference between Moses and the people of Israel at this time was understanding. If they have the understanding that Moses had, they would be able to generate the results that Moses would generate. This is how this kingdom works. And the children of Israel learned this, domesticated it, and made it a protocol that they began to live by. And it became a natural thing. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 to 12, when they built the temple, they followed the protocol again 
and the glory of God still appeared. And in fact, the Bible said the place was so thick that the priest could not stand to worship. Nothing happens by chance. In this kingdom, everything you see happening is deliberate. And when a man is able to replicate the things happening in and around his life, then you know that that man has gained understanding. And this is why we want to consider a few kingdom protocols this evening that will make everybody become a champion because you are a champion. You are a victor. There is nothing happening around your life that has the power to defeat you. The only defeat you are suffering now is your ignorance. The moment understanding comes, that thing that wants to make or bring shame to your life will become your platform for manifestation. I tell people many times, this pulpit is not the platform for manifestation. This elevated ground is not the platform for manifestation. The real platform for manifestation are the challenges of life that we go through. That's why the Bible said the light shines in the darkness. If there is no darkness, you cannot see the excellency of light. He said the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. So if you have understanding, any darkness the devil brings around you, you know that there is another room for testimony has been created because you know you can't go down. You know what to do to change things. This is why Jesus can afford to sleep in the turbulent boat. He knows what to do. He knows. The Bible said himself knew what he should do. 5,000 men were hungry. He knew what to do. He was in a boat that was about to capsize. He knew what to do. He was never stranded. Lazarus is dead. He knew what to do. When he showed up, instead of running to the grave, he took his time. You take your time when there is a dead person in the grave and he showed up and lifted up his hands and said, I thank you, O Father, because you always hear me. That means the key to raising the dead is you always hear me. If God does not always hear you, <laughs> the dead will remain dead. The man knew his Lord, his Lord, Jesus is Lord. Clap hands for Jesus. <laughs> My goodness. When I read some scriptures, ah. but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people called forth to showcase the excellencies of God. You don't have to be a prophet or an apostle to showcase God. You just have to go through crisis to showcase God. That's all it takes. When there is crisis, it's time to manifest. Because the light shines in the darkness. So the darkness can be in your office. The darkness can be in your family. The darkness can be anywhere. There's a reality of God that kills that darkness. Find it. That's your job. And tonight, I give you five basic protocols for provoking the dimension of God that handles your crisis. Are we ready? The first You know, this is Bible study. The idea is to create a mindset through the word. And so we give you the word in a way that you understand and can apply. And not just apply as a minister, but apply to your peculiar context. And the result you see becomes the basis for glorifying God. Praise God. And so follow me this evening. The protocol of manifesting God or manifesting the realities of God, which of course becomes the cure to your affliction. Number one is consciousness. You can never manifest what you are not conscious of. No matter the hands laid on you, no matter the oil poured on you, no matter where you go to, you are only able to manifest what you are conscious of. And when you become conscious of a thing, you don't need to struggle to manifest it. Your life force is deployed 
to manifest it. That's how man was built. Man was built to be able only to manifest what he's conscious of. That means the totality of your experience and the totality of your reality is a product of your consciousness. The boundary of your consciousness is the boundary of your reality. Your word is not what you are working on. Your word actually is the boundary of your consciousness. Everything you see and experience is a function of what you are conscious of. If your consciousness level increases, your experience spectrum increases. If your consciousness, consciousness level diminishes, the quality of your life and also the boundary of your experiences diminishes. And so it is the duty of man who wants to manifest a dimension to begin to build consciousness in that area. You know, as a minister of God, we go through a lot of things. In fact, we live, <laughs> our relevance is tied to responding to God and responding to the needs of people. As a minister, you are not relevant except as you are able to respond to the needs of God and to the needs of humanity. This is why you see many people struggle in life and ministry because they don't know. They think relevance in ministry is human connection. You can be connected to the biggest minister on earth today if you don't have value to offer. That position they place you will become your reproach. Positions don't make people. What they carry is what makes them. And what they carry is what God puts in them on account of their connection to God. So the way you build value is by building consciousness. Improve on the quality of your consciousness because the quality of your consciousness will become the quality of your life. There are many persons today that their consciousness is evil and evil continually. Even God can't help them. The first world was destroyed because of the imaginations of man. The first world was not destroyed because God was not powerful. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 6 from verse 5, it said the imagination in the heart of man is continually evil. And so because God saw that his consciousness was completely and continually evil, it was a waste for God to attempt to repair that world. God had to destroy it. The consciousness of man is that powerful. And so what you manifest is your consciousness and the way to build consciousness is to turn to the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, here was Paul talking to a church. A church that he started. A church that he expected to be manifesting God in a very excelling order. But unfortunately, they weren't. And so Paul brought them this parable. The reality is fixed, but your manifestation is not a product of the reality. It's a product of the consciousness. God said, you are rich, but whether you'll be rich will begin with your consciousness. God said, you are well, but whether you'll be well is a function of your consciousness. And so Paul was speaking to this church, and his argument was not the reality. His argument was their consciousness. And this is what Paul said. He said, if you are then risen with Christ... Because the truth is that when we gave our hearts to Christ, we came into the economy of the resurrection. And in the economy of the resurrection is eternal life. In the economy of the resurrection is immortality. In the economy of the resurrection is riches. In the economy of the resurrection is power. In the economy of the resurrection is everything God has to offer. But if you look at Christians today, more than 90% of Christians are not experiencing all the things that the Bible says. And so here was Paul speaking to the church. He said, if truly you are risen with Christ, he said, this is how you will manifest the order of the resurrected man. He said, set, seek those things which are above. Hope you remember that it was Paul that taught in Ephesians 1, 20, 21, that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But it's not everybody experiencing what it means to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Because in that scripture, one thing Paul revealed was that we are far above principalities and powers. How many people are living above principalities and powers? How many people are exerting authority over principalities and powers? So Paul is telling us that the reality is there, but for you to manifest it, number one, 
He said, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. And he went further to say, set your affection on those things above, not on the things on earth. Because the fact in the spirit is that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are far above principalities and powers. You should be a ruler. But if your affection is earthly, even though you are supposed to be with Christ in heavenly places, your manifestation will not be the manifestation of heavenly places. Your manifestation will be earthly. Because where your affection is, that's where your manifestation is. He says, seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated. Set your affection above where Christ is seated and not on earthly things. And so the first key to manifesting all of God is to focus on all of God until all of God becomes your consciousness. I was teaching you here on new creation realities the other day and I highlighted a few things. Let me show you what the Bible claims. And I use the word claim because until you prove it, it's a claim. That's why we are called witnesses. Are we together? Let me show you a few things that the Bible claims we have. It's called the new creation realities. Number one, if you look at the new creation realities, there's, there's what we call the essence of that being. And see what the Bible itemized under the essence of the new creation reality. Number one, he said he has the nature of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, he said, as he is, so are we, not in heaven, not after the rapture, so are we in this world. That's what the Bible says. As he is now, he says, so are we in this world. These are realities. Number two, he said, we have the life of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, he said, this is the record that the life is in the Son, and whoever had the Son had life. So, number one, we are what? We have his nature. Number two, we have his what? His life. Number three, is in 1 Corinthians 2, 16. He said, we have the mind of Christ. Now, check your life for a second. The life of God cannot be sick. How many of us have lived without sickness for one year? He said we have the nature of God. The nature of God does not sin. How many of us here have lived above sin for one week? You thought I would say one year. <laughs> it says you have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is creative, innovative, Powerful, full of love, full of compassion. Compare that with your mind. Does it look anything alike? This does not mean this reality is a lie. But it also means that you are not able to manifest it because it has not become your consciousness. If this reality truly becomes your consciousness, you will discover that everything the Bible says you are, that's what you will become. That means you will think at the frequency of Christ. You will live in the order of Christ. Is that not scary? Hearing this alone, does it not sound impossible? But this is what the Bible says we are. This is who we are now. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. And then I don't want to talk about material things yet. Because if you see the way Jesus lived, it was scary. Jesus lived in command of nature. He doesn't just possess, he commands nature. Once upon a time, he needed money. And he told the disciples, go to the sea. He said, cast thy hook. The first fish you bring out. I mean, what kind of investment is that? He said, pull the fish out, open its mouth. You will find a gold coin. So Jesus saves his money in the belly of fishes. The disciples wanted to sail. He said, go ahead. And the Bible said that the third watch, Jesus came walking on water. There are three miracles that happened in one story. Number one is that he was able to walk on water. That means he defied gravity. The second thing that happened was people who left nine hours ago 
How did you catch them? Because even if you are running on the water, you can't be faster than the boat. That means he was gliding. And the miracle didn't stop there. The moment Jesus entered the boat, the Bible said they were aground. That means the speed he carried, when he entered the boat, he added the speed to the boat, they left the middle of the sea and they came to the shore. And the Bible will say, as he is, so are we. There are two things here. <laughs> Either what the Bible is saying is not you. <laughs> or what the Bible is saying is a lie. But you and I know it cannot be a lie because heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of the world will pass away. And so if what the Bible is saying is not a lie, then we have not started living. That means what we have been doing all the while is rehearsals. We need to learn how to live. It's scary to say you are like Jesus. It's a scary thing. The kind of life he lived. But it's possible. And Paul is telling us the way we walk it is by setting our affection, setting our minds on the things that are above. By implication, you can also apply to whatever God tells you you will become you begin to set your affection there. That means if God tells you, you will be a king, you've got to set your whole consciousness there until you begin to think and act like a king. That's where your kingship begins from. Your kingship may not begin with a coronation service. Your kingship may not begin with an invitation to a palace. Your kingship will actually begin with a consciousness. If God tells you that you are wealthy, and you will sponsor nation. It's not when you have a capital you become wealthy. That means you have to, it has to become your consciousness to a degree that you cannot see yourself poor. It will take it another year or 10 years for you to be convinced that you are poor. Because what God told you, you will inundate your mind with it until it becomes your consciousness. Now, this thing looks simple, but this is this. This is actually our primary occupation in life. Our primary occupation is not the job we do. Our primary occupation is to renew our mind until our mind accepts everything God says we are. In Romans 12 verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world. It says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind because there is a perfect will of God that you are supposed to manifest. If your mind is not renewed, you can never become anything God says you are. That's your primary occupation. And it's beyond hearing a message and echoing it. Echo is not reality. Echo creates impression, not impact. What we are saying here, you know, there's a way the man's consciousness is built. The man's consciousness is built such that he has an active consciousness and a passive consciousness or a subconscious aspect. A man's true life is in his subconscious. As you are seated here now, let me give you an instance. If you hear a loud bang outside, your first response, I can assure you, will be fear. Before your brain begins to process what that sound is, who you are inside will respond before your brain responds. You hear a bang outside. Fear, the fear that will hit you. If it is close, there will be chaos here. Before we say what is happening, some people will be standing at that door and they will start asking themselves how they got there. The reason is because that aspect of them that is not always expressive is the most powerful aspect of them. It is when things happen suddenly that you find their reality. As you are seated here now, if you come home and they just give you a bag full of money, you kick it, you think it's clothes. Maybe it's jeans, they folded. You now opened it, you saw dollars. You will just move around first. The first thing you will think of is, ah, that car that uh, I was dreaming of, this is the time. <laughs> or you start thinking, that thought 
is your real consciousness. You may stand and tell God that, Lord, if you bless me, you know what I will do. He said, La. God is not hearing what you are saying only. God is reading your subconscious. Because that's your reality. And so if you, if you check your life carefully and you are a student of your spirit, roll back to five years ago, to ten years ago, you will discover everything you are now is what your subconscious mind was ten years ago. Nobody just appears. All of us are a product of a programming of our soul. And so Paul is teaching us that if we are hoping to manifest anything worthwhile, the first labor we must put on ground is to begin to reprogram our consciousness. And the way you reprogram your consciousness is through words and through pictures. Those are the two things that reprograms your consciousness. Words and pictures. If you want to be wealthy, if you want to be powerful, if you want to be holy, it's possible. But you will only be based on what is entering you. Because your life follows the law of Gigo. You garbage in, you garbage out. It's what you put in that you bring out. There, no miracle can on the, on set this balance. Even if a miracle happens to you, your consciousness will bring you back to status quo. That's why you can give a billion naira to a mentally poor person. Check him after two years. Instead of investing that money to become better, he will use that money to create problem. He will give 100 million to a poor man. He marries three wives immediately. That's where he will start from. And then he will go and buy four cars that he doesn't need. And each of the cars will be in millions. After two years, he will sell those cars and spend the money. And then the three wives will kill him of high blood pressure. That means what you call a blessing is a curse because the mind is wrong. These are kingdom principles. I'm a minister of God. Every day, I choke myself with scriptures. Every day, if I'm watching something, scriptures are coming out of it. And then I see things in the direction I'm going. Sometimes I'm just playing a healing video. Not because I'm not even hearing. I'm just seeing how people are standing up from which years. I'm just seeing how cancer, people are testifying. What I'm doing is that I'm trying to make that my reality. And if I do it after a long time, if I see a crippled person, the first thing that will happen to me will not be fear. Because my mind absorb this reality until it becomes my possibility. And if you do it for a long time, the people you are seeing doing it, they will leave the scene. You will start seeing yourself doing it. You are beginning to change your world. This is how manifestation come. You are a businessman. If you are not looking at a godly businessman who is doing well, until you begin to think only possibilities, your mind will be a mountain you will never scale. Because the first law of manifestation is the law of consciousness. You are not who you say you are. You are who you think you are. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Words are that powerful. Images are that powerful. Why do you think the people of the world are only interested in spreading negative news? Do something good nobody wants to hear. But evil and negative news, trap item you want to buy today, you'll find naked people on it. They don't need to open a church of fornicators. They don't need to open an institution of liars. If you keep seeing your thoughts will align, it's so hard to do it. Nobody advised you into it. They showed you into it and they talked you into it. Because your consciousness defines your essence. If your consciousness is different from what you say you are, of CDs, edit everything, and only press you will make. Even you will. If you will edit everything you hear and see, consciousness. If you get the consciousness right, your manifestation will have no choice but to align. No big man thinks himself poor. No healthy man thinks himself sick. No miraculous man thinks himself powerless. After 10 years, the experiences we should. Let your consciousness dominate you.
I read the book many years ago and the man made a statement. He said, if you like, train a servant to PhD level because certificates don't make men kings. Mindset makes men kings. Go and find out. Somebody graduates with first class. The first thing he's thinking of is when he goes for interview, they will consider him first. Because servanthood is his orientation. Somebody is doing a master's degree. He does one, does the second one, he's doing the third one. You ask him, he said it will increase his prospect. He has been in the university for 20 years to, get, to earn salary. And as if that's not enough, he enrolls for PhD. When you ask him, he said, no, there are few people with PhDs. So when I go, I'll be better. They will choose me first. But you'll find a king as he's in the university. He says, this program is beginning to delay me. The world is waiting for me. He's thinking of innovations. He's thinking of the problems he will solve. Whereas somebody else is burning the night candles. He's looking, his job is thinking of prospect. It's his mindset. There's nothing wrong in getting a job. God can even send you to a place and you can start from a job or from an employment. But a servant will remain a servant and a king will remain a king. What will take a servant from the place of a servant to a king is his mindset. If his consciousness does not change, if you like, award him a thousand certificates. You are preparing him to be a refined servant. Call for a job and ask for PhD holders. You'll be shocked the number of people that will come out. First degree, master's degree, PhD to get a job. And there are most of them who are still stranded. And when you ask them, they said they did their PhD seven years ago. You have not gotten a job in seven years. So what have you been doing in seven years? He has been searching. No problem solved. No challenge taken up. Because the mindset is the mindset of a servant. And so when God wants you to enter the realm of manifestation, the first thing he will do is that they will reprogram you. Because when they reprogram you, you start thinking differently and the manifestations that will follow will be in the order of your programming. That's how this kingdom works. And that's how man was built. Number two. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, hey. Hey, yeah. Before I touch number two, let me even say this again. I help somebody who is going through an addiction. It just dropped in my spirit now. It's only on very few occasions that addictions are broken by impartation. And the people that have the power to break addiction through impartation are not just anointed. They are those who are able to live above that thing. They are the ones that have the witness to break it. A man who is a liar can't break the addiction of lying, no matter how anointed he is. He's a slave of that spirit. A man who is a fornicator cannot break the addiction of pornography and masturbation. Or of immorality. Himself is a slave. No matter how anointed. He can raise cripples, open blind eyes. But he doesn't have authority in that realm. That's why when, you, when there's an addiction, the first thing to look out for is not somebody to pray for you. It's number one, to starve that addiction. Because what energizes that addiction is what you hear and see. If you starve that addiction for a long time, the power will die. And the connection that addiction has to your brain. Because... For every addiction, there are neurotransmitters that have been trained to create hormones that power it. When you starve it for a long time, those neurotransmitters will become dormant. And then you have the spirit to deal with. And the second way to address an addiction is to begin to hear contrary realities and see contrary realities. When you do it for a long time, your mind will be renewed. The spirit will no longer have the manipulative power over your mind. It's when these two things are done that you'll be able to cast out the demons and be free from the addiction. If you only cast out the demons, even if the demons don't come back, your brain is already secreting hormones. Your brain will take you back to that addiction. 
Your soul is already fine-tuned to operate by the law of that addiction. Your soul will take you back. The demon doesn't even need to come back. And so the way you engender that kind of deliverance is to first deal with your mind. Listen, your word is in your mind. I'm telling you, your word is in your mind. If your consciousness is wrong, your word will be wrong. Your life will be wrong. If your consciousness is right, your word will be right and your mind will be right. This is what the devil capitalizes on. This is why people are speaking in tongues for hours, but they can never become anything. When they are young, they will enjoy the energy that comes with it. After many years, you will discover that it's only a handful that become champions. Because if you pray and it doesn't affect your mindset, if you study and it doesn't affect your mindset, what you are doing is cramming. That's the difference between a brilliant child and an intelligent child. A brilliant child remembers to pass exam. An intelligent child solves problem. It's about the mind. Number two. Heart posture. Heart posture. Our manifestations respond to our heart posture. At least the one that God energizes and endorses. There are many spirits that makes for manifestation. Even the devil gives results. As, as well as God. God is not the only person that gives results. The devil also gives results. But the kind of results that God produces responds to a heart posture. When you're asking God to empower you with finance, when you're asking God to empower you with an anointing, the problem is not the anointing. And when God wants to check you, one of the parameters God will consider is why you are looking for financial power. Why you are looking for that anointing. That's what God is checking. In James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, hear what James was teaching the body of Christ. He said, from whence come war and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members. And he went further. He said, you lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. Go to verse 3. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. And so what the authority that releases manifestation is not based on just the desire to ask. It is what powers the motivation that powers that asking that the Spirit of God considers. Three people can go to the mountain and pray and ask God to anoint them with power to heal the sick. When God comes, He will come to answer all of them. But when he wants to answer them, what will determine who leaves the mountain with the anointing? It's not whether they completed the fasting or whether they completed the prayer. There are many factors. Your desire is there. All of that. But one of the things that cannot be compromised is why you are asking. And if God checks them out, the one who is asking for the benefit of humanity and not himself is the first person God will answer. Sometimes he may not even pray as much as the other ones. You will find one praying so that when he comes down from the mountains, he will prove a point to somebody who insulted his ministry and say, your ministry will not go far. And he wants to show that person that in this life, I will show you something. <laughs> you know, most times they teach at his church that God will answer you so that your enemies will be ashamed. It depends on the enemy. You ask the people who is their enemy first. If the devil is who you are referring to, it's fine. But some of the people you call enemy is a sister in choir. Some of the people you call enemy is a brother in the prayer band. And so that kind of enemy, God will not allow that enemy to be ashamed because if that enemy is ashamed, your pride would have enslaved you forever and ever. Because there are many people who beseech God to receive from God in order to prove a point. There are many people who ask God for money just to lavish it on their lust. I have suffered. Lord, 
Why are my mates doing what they are doing? What have I done? Well, if it's your mate you are thinking of, there are some in the grave now. Why not begin from there? <laughs> Lord, see what my mates are driving. God is not there to prove a point to your mate. Too. When God wants to answer your prayers, he will find out the motive. Because divine things are too precious to be wasted. He said, give not holy things to swine. He said, they will trample upon it and turn back at you. Because they don't value it. Somebody is looking for an anointing just to prove a point to somebody that him too, God has called him. Whereas, there are many people dying of sickness, he doesn't care. The anointing for him is just to show, to create a show. Let me show you some scriptures. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to verse 19, Jesus speaking. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me for, see the reasons, to preach the gospel to the poor. So the reason God anointed Jesus was not because of Jesus. It was because the poor needed to hear the gospel. If it was not about the poor, there wouldn't have been a need for him to be anointed. Number two, he said, to heal the brokenhearted. So the second reason he anointed him is because of the brokenhearted. Number three, he said to preach deliverance to the captives. The third reason is what? Because of the captives. Number four, he said recovery of sight to the blind. And he said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So the two reasons why Jesus was anointed was because of God's agenda and because of the plights that people were going through who needed God's intervention. So you don't need a healing anointing if you have no compassion for the sick. If God wants to anoint with the healing oil, what God will check is whether you are interested in seeing the sick healed. If you are not interested in seeing the sick healed, that anointing may never come upon your life. If God wants to empower you with finances, he knows that you have need and he, he wants to help you, bless you so that your needs are met. But what God wants to do is be, your needs are too small to be the reason why. If it is your needs alone, anybody around can be, God can move anybody around to address it. But if it is something that can affect your word, it has to be bigger than your needs. And that's why when Jesus' context was itemized, there was nothing about Jesus that was mentioned here. So you can rightly say Jesus was not anointed because of Jesus. Jesus was anointed because of the will of the Father and because of the plight of the people. He was the one who gave the manifesto. Are you following? He goes and with power who went about buying lands and going on holidays. <laughs> who went about living large because of the message of Jesus, of, of God. It's Jesus I'm talking about. It's a to see, if you want it fast, look for the problem. Hen Hannah came to God and was crying for a child. Fanny has, has many. She doesn't even need them. Why? God opened it. She had left him. But now that somebody wants to attend to, and now you want it. God did not only give her Samuel. God gave her five other children. You came to God. Trust me, there are other people who are interested in something bigger. Ephesians 4.28 I get anointing, anointing. Let's touch money a bit. He said, let him that stole steal. He said, him that stole shall steal no more. Let him labor with his hand. And you think somebody who labors should be the partaker, the first partaker. I'm stealing to survive. You say, I should stop stealing. It's beyond you. God comes in. That's when you substitute self for God, you will discover that you don't need to dwell long on that matter. God will answer you speedily. Because if God answers you, you will become an answered prayer to another person. It's called the protocol of manifestation. A brother met me the other day and he was so troubled. Why was he so troubled? He said he needs money. What kind of thing is this? I started in my heart, I say, Lord, help this man, help this man. 
hope the love of money has not attacked his soul. Help this man. I started interceding. So I said, let's see. Because some conversation is not on phone. <laughs> man of God, they have me. I can't. Now, I got scared. I said, hey, down. He said, no. This is a man God is about to bless. He said, we need bosses. How can we? He said, look at the last medical. God will embarrass you with wealth. A vacation. And then the third thing is, as you see, manifestation is a game of authority. Seeing and manifesting any dimension is working under authority. And authority in the kingdom is a matter of height. And so before you find anybody who is manifesting any dimension, he is ascending very high. He's talking from up because he's seated above principalities and powers that give you authority that there is deliverance of God on the mountains of God. And he said, men of seed, the Lord. Somebody say, but he said, we have come. I was, I was so tired. I couldn't pray. I tried to pray. Imagine you go to pray. You are put, all put together. Shut down for one week. In one week, my engine had not yet reboot. Ah, uh -uh. there's problem. When I started praying, the Holy Ghost now opened my eyes to see the activity of demons. And I saw a creature. You know, those days we were young, we used to climb waste beams and we'll be hitting the waste beam cars from empty cans of milk and bomb vita. We will now tear it and build cars, put a long stick and we'll be driving on high speed. <laughs> high speed, overtaking ourselves. And so God opened my eyes. The way we used to stamp, you know, trample on those things to create space. That was how I saw a demon walking. <laughs> what is happening? That's your soul. He's trampling on. He doesn't want your soul to ascend. Ah! So I'm not tired. It's warfare. <laughs> my God. If you know how demons walk, the hardest man on earth is lazy. Demons, the way they say they roam like roaring lion. If a demon is walking, they don't breathe. A demon was busy hitting on my soul down. This one will never pray in his life again. He's finished. The next thing is, is death and immorality. Jesus Christ. And you don't know what, what is happening. You now find yourself, the old man will resurrect. Because if the soul is not ascended, the, the old man will rise again. And you will go back to the things that you were delivered from. That was when I started worrying. I started worrying until I expelled the demons. Now, I ensure that my soul is always on cruise boat. Because I don't want to come down for... <laughs> they are strange creatures. And so every time you find somebody manifesting a dimension, he is standing somewhere on the mountain of God. It takes height to manifest if you don't go high, your mindset will become optimism. That's where the problem is. And so in addition to the right consciousness, in addition to the right heart posture, there must be ascensions in the spirit. And ascension has protocols. Psalm 24 from verse 3. It says, who shall ascend the mountains of God? Who? The thing is open for everybody, but who shall? Can I tell you something? Out of all of us sitting here, there are not less than 10 people here with a cutting edge healing anointing. Cutting, I mean cutting edge. The minimum here will be 10 that can lay hands on the blind and the eyes will open, deaf ears on stop. Not, not, less, not less than 10. Among all of us sitting here, if we are few, there are at least seven people who should be economic giants because of the level of inspiration they had from when they were children. If you carry a child, you can discern that child. When you see the eyes of a child, you can tell the, the illumination from that child. That's what they call star. The star of a child is the brilliance that comes out of his spirit and you see it through their eyes because the eye is a torch in the spirit realm. 
In the spirit realm, eyes are not eyeballs, they are touches. And so if you, a man of understanding, if you look at a child, you can see the rays from his eyes. You can tell whether this one is great. And at least seven persons here. In this small number. But you see, and I can also tell you that some of us, the time for the manifestation is long overdue. Because from the visions God showed you, from 19, you should have taken over your territory. At 21, you should have, make, you should have been making national impact. But you are 38 now. It's not based on God. It's based on when you are sent. If you are sent now, strange things will begin to happen. That's how it works. If you don't ascend, you will remain under the mountain for a long time. Hope you know that he didn't say you have ascended Mount Zion. He said you have come to Mount Zion. When you come to Mount Zion in Christ, you will now ascend with the Holy Spirit. And the way you ascend with the Holy Spirit, he said, who shall ascend the hills of God? Who shall stand on his holy mountains? Because there are three things about authority. Number one is to ascend. Number two is to stand. And number three is to dwell. I knew ascension and standing until last, last week a friend now began to tell me about dwelling. A man who dwells has more rank than a man who stands. But many have not even ascended or, stand, or, stand, or are standing yet. Meanwhile, there are those who dwell in the mountains of God. And there are those who live, who proceed from, from Zion. Because he said, Savior shall come forth. So they are, we have come to Mount Zion in Christ. And then with the Holy Spirit, we ascend, we stand, we dwell, then we go forth. This is the economy of the mountain of God. But to ascend, let's talk ascension because that's where we are now. If we want to talk, go forth. It will be complex. Because when you go forth, you become the law. Moses went to Horeb. But eventually, Moses became the law. Verse 4. Three credentials. Number one, it's a him that has a clean hand. That's your way of life. A clean hands is not your palm. It's your way of life. Uprightness and integrity. This is why I tell you it's beyond praying in capital letter tongues. If you are praying in capital letter tongues and you are a thief, you can't stand on Mount Zion. Ascension, they will probe you because it's a place of authority. You are taking bribe, God will forgive you, but you can never wield authority. And so it takes integrity and uprightness to ascend Zion. Number two, it said him that has not, who has a pure heart. A pure heart. This is heart, a heart of love. Love, that's the nature of God he's talking about here. A heart, a tender heart, a heart full of love for the brethren, full of love for one another. Because what we are talking about here is God entrusting you with authority. And God won't do that if you are not somebody that loves the brethren. And so a pure hand is upright living. A pure heart is a posture of love. Bitterness, backbiting, malice, you want to ascend the mountain of God. No way. The angels will help you. This is, this is business of power in the kingdom. And then finally, he said he has not lifted up his soul in vanity. Pride. It takes brokenness to be able to receive the scepter of God and provoke a manifestation. It takes brokenness. That's why men who make great impact in this kingdom they are really the most humble people. If you don't discern them, you may judge them based on their temperament. They are those who are vocal. They are those who are not necessarily vocal. They are those who are outgoing. They are those who are indoors. 
There are those who are social. There are those who are not very social. It's not about personality. Because due to lack of discernment, when you find somebody who is bold and vocal, you call it pride. But it's not about, it's not pride. Pride is a hard posture. You can see somebody bending for everybody. He is more proud than, some people are so proud that he's irritated. When you want to greet them, they say, no, they are brothers. Call them brothers. And the next sentence you will hear is that they are not like all these other people. <laughs> no, 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 I'm a brother. I'm not like all these prophets. Mm -mm. that, that that's concentrated pride. You find some people, they see you, they do like this. And you will think they are humble. Tomorrow you now walk past, you didn't notice, you didn't know they were there to greet them. The next thing they will say, well, all these young boys, because we humbled ourselves. <laughs> you didn't humble yourself. That's hypocrisy. And so, the three things that make for ascension is a way of life that is just and upright. It's a heart that is full of love and it's a soul that is broken in humility. If you don't have these three things, if you like, your tongue should be the strongest tongue you are at. If you like, pray longer than all the church put together you are at. In fact, long prayer that showcases itself is called Phariseeism. That's the way of Pharisees. They say they love to pray long and stand by street corner that they may be noticed. He said they have their reward. If you like, quote one million scripture, you are on earth. Because the sign that your prayer is beginning to touch a chord in the spirit, the sign that your scripture is beginning to flow from inspiration, is when your heart enters this, the frequency of brokenness. It's when your heart enters the frequency of love. That's when you, that prayer is beginning to touch you. That prayer can now carry you. That scripture can now carry you. If not, it will take you nowhere. If it is divine manifestation you are looking for, believe me, I'm telling you, people know plenty of scripture. So. Some of the things I experience now, I was quoting them 10 years ago. Fluently and intelligently. In fact, after a while, I now discover that sometimes if you quote scriptures too much, you mock yourself. So I started holding my peace. I will come for a healing service from the introduction. I will do introduction with 12 scriptures. Ba, 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 ba. 12. When I, that 12 scripture is a progression of healing. When I finish, then I'll say, okay, let's begin with the Bible. I will now teach for one hour. I say, that is introduction. Let's start. When I finish preaching, we will now say, in the name of Jesus, we will scream. When you say if you are healed, wave your hand. You will look from left to right, from front to back, no hand is up. You will now say, let's worship God. <laughs> let's worship God first. Maybe they've not heard. You will worship God for 10 minutes and come back, raise your hand. Somebody will now notice that Kai, this man of God is about to be embarrassed, at least for his boldness. Two people will come out and say, I had a headache when I was coming. I don't know. I can't feel it anymore. <laughs> Kai! Because they will notice that ah, your face was glowing. Sweat now. The frequency of sweat coming down has increased. Though. How come you're, you are not looking so wet? Veins. They are noticing veins on the screen. They will now say, yesterday I ate something. I was purging. Now I don't, I don't feel it anymore. Where is the pain? It's somewhere here. Even the person doesn't know where the pain. They want to help you. And then sometimes the, the interpreter, go seven! There's a miracle here. What happened? <laughs> he said he had a headache. But when he came in here, the headache disappeared. <laughs> Headaches don't disappear. Now are you seeing it? The whole hall will be shaking. What is the testimony? <laughs> there was stomach pain. It has been there since morning. Uh -uh. The service is in the evening.
I now discover this thing is beyond quoting scriptures. It's beyond quoting. How does it work? How do we manifest God? He said the hands must be clean. Because the healing service began when you went to the office. The healing service began when they confronted you with bribe. The healing service began when you had issues with that person. And you went to speak evil of that person. And the Holy Ghost was moved in your heart. Troubled you. Keep quiet. You lied against that person. The Holy Ghost said no. Say the truth. And you kept quiet. You can't go up. The healing service doesn't begin two hours to the meeting when you knelt down. And you were speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. No. It began when one week ago. When you were walking about. That's called a clean hand. People don't know how spiritual things work. We think we can bribe God. You want to go for, you want to go for a job interview. You roll from one end of your door to the other side. You roll from that side and come back. You roll again and go back and say, God, I love you. I love you. Lord, do this and take the glory. It's not through your life only that it will be proven that God is God. From ages past, the whole universe knows that it's God. We want to manipulate God. We want to use God. When you are a baby, He will look at you and encourage you. Maybe one time, two times, three times. When you start growing, that thing will stop. The first time I started praying for the sick, we, we, we taught it when we shouted that the demons used to hear, Come out! We will do, Come out! With the person will fall down. You will now walk like this. <laughs> Say, No, leave her. She's okay. With your low, bogus pride, the angels are looking at you. After a while, the rules changed. If you come and shout, come out. The Holy Ghost will now remind you of the malice you are keeping somewhere. How does malice affect the anointing for healing? Okay, Lord, if, if it's not about me, at least this person believes in you. Don't worry. Another person will heal her. You are not the only person I'm using. Okay, Lord, how about your glory? These people are watching now. If this person is healed, at least they will know that you are God. They know. That's how we try to deceive God for many years. We now discover that the standard of the law standeth sure. It doesn't shake. It doesn't shake. That standard is sure. So don't run to God when you have a problem. When you have a problem is where you should manifest God. But if you don't know this protocol, your life will keep vasculating up and down, up and down, up and down. So the third protocol is the protocol of what? Ascension. The fourth protocol is the act of faith. You will notice that the first three things we mentioned were internal. That means manifestation is more internal than is external. Miracles are not a product of activities. They are a product of yieldedness. You are carried into manifestation. You don't jump into it. This is why when a man wants to walk in an undeniable order, more happens within him than without him. And so consciousness must be right. Heart posture must be right. Ascension must be attained. When these three things are in place, then you can come to the actions of faith. The problem we had when they started training us was that these ministers didn't share their experiences with us. They didn't share the things God told them. And so we didn't know. They just came, quoted scriptures, told us what to do, and we were doing it and we almost died. We didn't know the organic side. Bought suits, bought shoes that look like certain ministers. Walk like them. And at the end of the day, we never had their results. I can't tell you 
10 years ago, is it 10 or 12 years ago, if you saw my picture, my hair was permed. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> 10 years ago, I used to perm my hair like Pastor Chris. Then we walked like this. If we are standing, this is how we stand. If we are walking and teaching, we walk like this. You know the Lord is in this place. As we are talking, the atmosphere will be dying. <laughs> Meanwhile, he is talking everywhere, he's charging. You, you are talking, the atmosphere is dying. Pastor Chris will just come. Whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creature. You will now come and say, new creature. <laughs> Why he say cripples are standing, you are saying it, people are sleeping. What is happening here, sir? It's beyond suit and shoe. There's nothing wrong with the suit. Learn the good things. Speak well, but have power. <laughs> have power. I now went and washed my hair and, and cut it. <laughs> because the warfare that was even coming to me, the, the favor and glory of my life was not enough to handle it. So, because if I show up, they, they reject me. Because I now bab the hair first. And say, wait, when I understand what this man understands, I can do what I want. But this thing is not working. <laughs> we now sat down. We started hearing the messages again. That was when we now knew the dealings of God on their lives. We knew dealings. Because the organic part is heavier. The organic. Heavier. The other day I was driving and the Holy Ghost collided with me in the car. I said, how can you believe? I said, ah, what do you mean by how can you believe? I believe. I'm a believer. He said, when you are interested in the praise that comes from men and not the praise that comes from God only. Ah, ah. What is happening? I was being judged. You know the Bible says, you, will be, you should be judged so that you are not judged. So for me to enter another phase, this is the requirement. I thought I needed to increase my prayer. He said, no. When you are interested in the honor that comes from men, more than the honor that comes from God, you can't believe. Because faith has different laws at different levels. It's called ascension. Now, when you have ascended, then you can now do the works of faith. If you don't ascend and you do the works of faith, you won't have results. No matter how you try to manipulate God and say, Lord, these people are atheists. If this miracle happens here, they will believe you forever. It's a lie. The children of Israel, they saw a miracle for 40 years. They didn't repent. The pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud walked with them. They were seeing wonder for 40 years. They didn't believe. His conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's what converts men. Not what people see. Some people can even see a miracle. It's the reason why they will say, all these pastors are fake. So stop manipulating God. Follow the protocol. When you have ascended, then the actions of faith begins. Let me read two scriptures for you. In James chapter 2 verse 19 and 20. I'll just read James 19, 2, James 2, 19, 20 and 26. Hear what the Bible says. He said, thou believest that there's only one God. He said, thou doest well. He said, the devil also believes and trembles. That means if it is believing alone, the devil believes better than you. You believe. He said, the devil believes and trembles. He said, but oh vain man, faith without works is dead. That means what brings validation are the actions of faith that you engage. And see verse 26. Hear what he said. He said, for as the body without the spirit is dead, that is how faith without works is dead. And so if you want to see a manifestation, you must take action. Only those who take action see. If you are waiting to see before you take action, you will see nothing all your life. But if you want to see, begin to take action. 
and you will see what God will do in and through your life. Sometimes it may be against contrary situations and sometimes it may be a pleasant condition. Whichever you find yourself in, take action first before the finger of God manifest. The finger of God awaits your action of faith. If you don't take those steps, God will never show up. Hear the stories, recite it, preach it, you will not see the result. Until you are able to walk on water, you can't see the glory of walking on water. I wanted to read the scripture for you, but I don't have time. You know, in 2 Kings chapter 7, there was a famine in the land. And God had spoken through his prophet that by this time tomorrow, he said a cup of barley will be sold for one shekel. A miracle was already hanging in the spirit, but it couldn't manifest. God was waiting for those who will act. And in the whole city, nobody acted. Four lepers were the ones who acted. Four lepers. That means it is the one who takes the action that commands the result. Whether he takes the action that commands the result. And if nobody takes the action, the prophecy can hang for another generation. And the guy stood up in verse 3 and said, Why sit we here until we die? And they went out. As they started going, miracles began. Before they approached the camp, the people in the camp started hearing sounds of chariots. No chariot was coming from anywhere. You don't know how many they killed. And God, that means actions. The leftover is what belongs to them. You want a life that will be admired. You want a glorious life. You've got to start taking actions. If people keep taking actions for you, get ready to live at the level of crumbs and leftovers. And imagine some leftovers are from lepers who are bold enough to take action. That means even the king in that city was eating from the leftover of a leper. At that moment, his kingship became a title. The guy who took action is a real king. That's how this life works. Many are not taking actions. They have the best visions in their head. They have the best innovations in their head, but it remains in their head. They have all the solution in the world. It's in their heads. They never take action. They are afraid. The law of faith is, why sit we here until we die? That means if you don't move, you will actually die. Your life and the quality of your life is at the mercy of your action. And so that vision you are procrastinating on, hoping that one day it go better, there is no day like that. Those who understand the ways of God have studied the realms. They know that the only day that awaits men are evil days. But when you rise up, the evil day becomes the day of manifestation. Actions. It changes everything. I have many scriptures, but I can't read them. Three steps you must take when taking actions for God to recognize. Number one, speak it. That's where actions begin from. You know, in the, in the, in the era of, war, of wars, of sovereignty, kings knew how to win. It's talk. If you can't talk, you are finished. In this life, if you cannot talk, you are finished. Those days when kings want to go to war, the army will gather and then they will bring the orators. If the orators talk, all your adrenaline will rise up. And you will see people fight to the death. So victories and conquests are actually a product of the right wars. That's what the Bible means when it calls it wars in season. To be able to utter the right word at the right time is a gift. And men who take actions that produce results one thing they know to do and know to do very well is to speak correctly. They say the right thing at the right time in the right place. If you can get this, even the word can be given to you. 
wars they are some of the most powerful weapons you can find on the face of the earth and so here was Paul's verdict in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13 he said according as it is written he said they believe and have spoken he said we also having the same spirit of faith we believe and the proof that we believe is that we speak if we don't speak it means we don't believe but the moment we believe we begin to speak you cannot see a word that you have not spoken else you will live in the one somebody has spoke you into and so if you don't want to live in the reality somebody has created you must create yours with words create it listen make talking a way of life the reason people go nowhere and have no no worthy manifestation is because most times the things they even say are the topics others raise for them when you should be talking your way forward and upward they bring somebody's matter to you and you sit on it and talk for three hours and you think you are making progress after 10 years both you and the person talking about that person you will still talk because it means that person is the one creating news for you when you find great people they have talking sessions the way they have thinking sessions some people will lock themselves in the room stand in front of the mirror ceos and tell themselves they can do it they've done it before they will do it again and if they don't do it nobody else will and they will do it so that the lives of others will be better it's because they do it that's why the world is a better place and they will talk themselves until the anointing will rise sometimes you need to go and lock yourself in the room and tell yourself i am the head and the head only everything i do prospers i don't know how to fail what you are doing is that you are not psyching yourself you are re-educating your spirit you are reprogramming your soul because what you say is what you become he said keep me in remembrance of my word according to thy word thou shalt be justified that means your justification is at the mercy of your speakings isaiah 44 verse 26 and in isaiah 44 36 he said i the lord i confirm the words of my servants i perform the counsels of my messengers god says you should remind him of what he will do for you and god says he will honor what you say and you are there saying it's not working i'm a failure oh my god is this how we finish well, you are about to finish because you are writing the script of your manifestation. But there are some of us who walk in the glory life, in the glorious experience, because we know it, we think it, and we talk it. You will never catch me. The other, the other day I stood up in my room and I was walking like this. And my wife showed up and started laughing. She wanted to give me a cup of water and I, I stood like this. When she served the water, I collected it and drank. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a king. I'm rehearsing my life. <laughs> I'm a king. I'm a king. I talk it until it must become. See, even when you are casual, be royally casual. <laughs> be royally what? Casual. Don't throw your life away. See, be careful. He said, life and death. See, when the spirit is speaking, pay attention. No. He said, life and death is in the power of the tongue. He didn't say it's in the tongue. The power of the tongue is what the tongue says. Life and death is in your speakings. If you speak evil, you see evil. Speak good, you speak good, you see good. Speak glory, you see glory. That's how this realm works. When we come for a power service, how do we go into power? Is it not by talking? You come for service, any service I want to operate in power, I start casually and I talk the whole congregation into a power realm. And the power of God is moving. Some people are slain, some people are having vision. How did I create it? I created it by talking. And if I can talk a hundred people into an atmosphere of power, is it my own destiny I won't talk into it? That means you can keep your atmosphere charged every day. Because if I come for a one hour, 30 minute service 
and I can talk power into the atmosphere until the power becomes so tangible that people are being slain, healings are taking place. What will happen if I channel that voltage to my job? If I channel that voltage to my family? The same way the anointing saturates the building, it can saturate my family. It can saturate my job because the way you act is first by talking. Do you know that it is this same talking we talk that the angels of healing enter the auditorium? Because by talking, we open the doors for them. The same way we talk, that's how we talk, and angels of prosperity enter. And I'm talking, 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 and I say, somebody is receiving the land. And one week later, somebody receives 22 hectares of land because the world created that possibility. And then you want to be casual about what you say, the first way to change your destiny is by your words. And so when you find overcomers, they are overcomers primarily because of what they say. Don't let anybody get you to talk yourself down, talk yourself out, or talk your way into death. Rather, if they say what is not consistent with your life, don't keep quiet. If you keep quiet where your destiny is being decided, you are gone. If they say what is not consistent with your scroll, catch it. Throw it away. Not me. No. Somebody tells you you will die. You say, no, we don't die. We live to proclaim the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And we don't just live. We reign in life. We reign. Because there's a difference between living and reigning. It's a day we receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. And so if you tell me something will go wrong with me, you are joking. I tell you, no, I reign. I reign, I reign. That's all I know. I say it until I bet it. You are a spirit being. And because you are a spirit being, your words are not only for communication. The first time words were used, they were not for communication. They were for creation. Your manifestation is at the mercy of your speakings. That's why you have to re-educate your tongue. There are some people who unconsciously speak wrong. You need to go and sit down and re-educate your tongue. And there are two ways of doing it. Either you write out what you want to say and begin to say it, or listen to those who speak correctly and hear them for a long time. You too will start talking correctly. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I tell myself, the world has not seen anything. I'm a glorious light. I'm shining. I'm overcoming. I'm taking over. I just see. It looks as if I'm psyching myself. I've must, I enjoy it now. And you see things happening on their own accord. You are a banker. You have not told yourself you are the best in the world. You have not told yourself you are starting your own bank. <laughs> you don't know how these things work. You are a product of all your speakings. Your life is reflecting all you have said. If you want to find out what you have said, don't go and listen to what you said in the past. Check your life. Your life is an aggregation of all you have said. You are the proof of your speakings. And then the second way of taking action is to program your outcome. And in scripture, there are not too many ways of programming. One of the most potent ways of programming is by prayer. In 1 Kings 17 verse 1, Elijah stood before the king and said, Before God whom I stand, there shall be no rain or dew. If you didn't know the organic, you will think, my God, Elijah is powerful. He spoke and things are happening. No, it, don't happen, it doesn't happen like that. In James 5 16, the Bible told us what Elijah did after speaking. He said he prayed earnestly that it should not rain. And it did not rain. So after Elijah spoke, Elijah went back and wrote the program. And the way to write the program is by prayer. You condition it. And when Elijah was done, in 1 Kings 18, verse 41 to 44, see what Elijah did. This is spiritual intelligence. You want to find a man who has manifestation and can replicate it. He knows these things. He said, and it came to pass after, okay, many days, that Elijah said unto her, 
get thee up, eat and drink, go back. Quickly, verse 42. He said, get thee up, eat and drink. And Elijah went up to Camel and he cast himself down to the earth and put his face in between his knees. The guy showed up, told the king, relax. Why are you behaving like this? Go home and eat. Rain will come. He didn't see anything, but he knows programming. When he finished talking, the Bible said he went to Mount Camel. Are you hearing ascension? He ascended and then he cast himself down. Put his face in between his, knee, his knees. And what did he start doing? He started praying. He started praying. And as he was praying, he was asking his servant, go and check. Because he knows what he was doing is a program. He said, go and check. One time, two times, three times, four times. If you don't know it, you would have relaxed and said, this thing is not working. Elijah knew it like he knew his name. And the guy went on to seven times. And until the seventh time, he said, I saw what looked like the feast of a man. And he said, that is the sound of an abundance of rain. That is the sound. I finished the program. And the moment it happened, in verse 44, the guy stood up. Prayer has ended. Because prayer is not a religious activity. Prayer is a program. I'm done with the program. The manifestation has come. Immediately, there was an abundance of rain. And it didn't stop there. The energy and the leftover from that program fell upon him. And he said the hand of God was upon Elijah. And he outran the chariot of Ahab. The problem with you is that you talk, you don't program. When I tell you tomorrow is a power service, meet me the day before. I wake up in the morning, everybody in my house knows that you can't greet me at that time. Because the power service I told you about, I have to go and write it on the altar. If I finish writing it, I can stroll here with a white suit and make declarations and they will happen. The problem most people have is that they don't write program. We need programmers. We need programmers. When you are praying, you are creating the outcome. You are creating the outcome. And when you are done writing, there's what we call the note of victory. The body will lift. You know that it is done. When you come into the service, you can choose to wear a jean and t-shirt. There will be healing. You can choose to wear a white suit. There will be healing. You can choose to wear an agbada. There will be healing. Because the healing is not in the dress. It's in the program that you have written. Sometimes you write that program until your eyes will open. You will start seeing the service before you come for it. Life is lived deliberately. Nothing happens to those who create change. They make it happen. And the way to make it happen is first of all, talk it and then program it. If you are in light, priesthood is a sentence. You can't deny it. Because all your outcome, you create them on the altar. You think the politicians that come to boast, they are not spiritually intelligent. They are highly, highly, highly intelligent. When they are done speaking in the night, they are carrying a goat somewhere, tying only wrapper. They are programming it because the world will be empty if it is not programmed. When they finish that assignment, if you like, do a rally. They know what they've done. They know the potency of what they've done. Only believers lack spiritual intelligence. Don't talk and sleep. Talk and pray. That's how it works. When you are done talking, go to your altar. Pray until the body lifts. That time answer has come. Even if the devil gangs up, he can't change it. And the person talking to you is not giving you lectures. I've been, into, I've been in terrible situations. Terrible situations. I know how to program my way out of debt. I know how to program my way out of failure. I know how to program my way out of reproach and frustration. It's on the altar. If you will dig deep, you will find the part that no foul know it. The part that the vulture's eyes have not seen. Is a part on the altar. And only those who travel by the spirit will find it. When you find it, you become as ancient as the one that speaks your destiny. And then when you are done programming, then you do. You do it. That's why I say faith without works is dead. You stand up, you say you own the biggest real estate investment in Africa. You have spoken well. Now that you have spoken well, go and create it in prayer. 
When you now finish creating it, as money begins to come, start buying lands. These three things must happen. You must create it, you must program it, and you must start taking act. The moment God sees that the cycle has been completed with action, then God releases his spirit. That's when it will begin to grow beyond your understanding. Many people don't see manifestation because they don't know the protocol. It begins with consciousness. It goes into heart posture. It moves into ascension. And then it moves into actions of faith. When you perfect actions of faith, then the last protocol, which is number five, is to glorify God. Because at the end of the day, it is not about what you did. It's about what he will do or what he has done. If he has not done anything and if he will not do anything, all you have done will count for nothing. And so in Jeremiah 30 verse 19, hear what the Bible says. It says, out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry and I will multiply them and they shall not be few. So as you give thanks, God is the one that brings the multiplier effect. I will multiply them, they shall not be few. I will glorify them, they shall not be small. This is where manifestation culminates. When thanksgiving, praise and glorification goes up, multiplication begins. In Acts 2.47, the Bible said daily they were praising God. And it said as they were praising God, it said the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I know you are going through a crisis. There's no doubt about it. You don't even need word of knowledge to know. Africa is hard. A lot of people are going through stuff. Not very pleasant ones. But if you allow the crisis you are going, in, going through, enter into your spirit and create turbulence, you will drown. Somebody said, no matter how big the water outside the boat is, it can't drown the boat. But the water in the boat is the risk of the boat. The water in the boat is the water that drowns the boat. And so your crisis may look as if if there's nothing done now, you will die. Your crisis may look as if if there's nothing done now, you will die later. Whichever way the devil presents it, if you are a spiritual man, what you do is that you begin to follow this protocol. The first thing you do is that you separate yourself from the condition and you begin to build the mindset. You begin to build the consciousness. As you build that consciousness, begin to purify your soul. Remove selfishness from it and fill it with God. Fill it with others. After a while, begin to ascend in the spirit. As you ascend in the spirit, then begin to take acts of faith. Take acts of faith. Before you know what is happening, you will not just come out of that crisis, you will become the solution for others. This is how rulers live their lives. Ask anybody making impact in the kingdom. He knows this. He may not group it the way I've grouped it, but he knows this and he does this every day. And trust me, ask every person who is not making impact. He doesn't know this and he doesn't do this. The difference between an impactful person and an unimpactful person is the degree to which they commit themselves to the protocol of manifestation. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in politics, you can be in business, you can be in ministry, the principles are the same and they are eternal. The question tonight is, if we open your mind now, what is your predominant consciousness? If we play your thought on this screen, what is your predominant consciousness? Trust me, you don't need a prophet. That thing that you will see, it will happen in your life. Just give it time. If it is fear, fear will happen. If it is failure, failure will happen. If it is sin, sin will happen. Your consciousness is the first navigatory part of your destiny. Most times, we take the responsibility for our manifestation away from ourselves and we put it on others. That's why people determine our progress in life. That's why people determine our pace in life. Everybody 
should become the architect of his destiny, walking in partnership with the Holy Spirit because that's the order of the New Testament. If your consciousness is wrong, it's time to get to work. There are records of death. There are records of fear. There are records of failure heaped in your subconscious mind. You need to uproot them. And I told you the way to uproot them is by the word and by the things you see. And after that, you need to purify your heart. Selfishness takes nobody anywhere. Selflessness takes men to the highest point in life. And after that, you have ascension. You have works of faith. And then you have thanksgiving to God. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you. I can tell you, I know where I'm going. And I know why I'm not yet there. It's not the devil. Trust me when I tell you this. I know where I'm going. And I know why I've not gotten there. It's not the devil that is the cause. And it's not any mortar on earth. I'm the reason I've not gotten, gotten to where I'm, I'm, I'm going. The only two persons that can stop you from becoming anything God says is God and yourself. And God is not stopping you. And so if you have not arrived there, please stop accusing the devil. Wake up. Take responsibility. You will discover that the fight against the devil was ended. You are the one who, have not claimed, who has not claimed your victory. And the key is consciousness. The key is heart posture. The key is ascension. The key is acts of faith. And the key is glorifying God. This is the prayer. It's simple. Father, open my understanding. I'm telling you, many persons have made it their, their excuse, accusing the government for their failure. Many, they've made it an excuse, accusing the devil for their failure. Many, they've made it an excuse, accusing others for their failure. I came to tell you, the government is not the reason for your failure. The devil is not the reason for your failure. Men are not the reason for your failure. You are the reason for your failure. And there's a cure. The cure is to change your consciousness. The cure is to change your heart posture. The cure is to ascend with God in the spirit. The cure is to begin to take steps of faith. And the cure is to begin to glorify God. of the people we celebrate today had a better reason not to succeed than ourselves. The reason we celebrate them is because they accomplished greater challenge than we've ever accomplished. If there's any man you are celebrating today, you are celebrating him because he accomplished greater challenges than you have ever achieved, accomplished. And because his challenges are greater than yours, he had a better excuse to fail. But they refused to fail. If they refused to fail and they succeeded, then I speak over your life and I prophesy this evening. Whatever that mountain is, it will not take you down. I decree over your life and destiny, you will not fail. The power to manifest the power to succeed in the name of Jesus the Lord. 
Receive it now. Hear this. There are many widows that became champions in life. There are many orphans that became champions in life. There are many disabled people that became champions in life. I know one called Nick Butchkix, born without arms and limbs. He, had, he has two master's degrees. There are many Africans who are making great impact in life. All the excuses you have to fail, I'm sorry, a lot of people who came ahead of you already made them no excuses. Those who came ahead of you denied you the opportunity of having excuses. You have none. And so tonight, as you make up your mind, not just to succeed, but to manifest God, in the name of Jesus, receive the power to manifest. Receive the power to manifest. Receive the power to manifest. Can I shock you? There are many illiterates that are making impact in life. There are many university dropouts that are making impact in life. If they did not fail, you will not fail. If they did not fail, you will not fail. Can I shock you? There are many women who were raped who are making impact in life. There are many young people who lost their parents at tender age who are making impact in life. There are many people who were once demonized who are making impact in life. If what they went through did not stop them, I decree over you tonight, no power under heaven is qualified to stop you. Receive grace to conquer. Receive grace to prosper. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The Bible said the light shines in the dark. And the darkness comprehends it not. As you step out of this auditorium, every darkness in your life that should have been the reason for your downfall, I decree it becomes the reason for your testimony. That thing that was a darkness becomes the reason why your world will remember you. It will become your gateway to exploit. In the name of Jesus, arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen over you. Arise and shine. Arise and shine. Arise and shine. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. 